turn in our Bibles. You have your Bible to 2 Samuel, the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 23, and we'll read a couple verses there, starting in, in verse 8. And 2 Samuel 23 and verse 8, reading down to verse 10, it says, And these be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800, whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were, gathered, that were there, gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Maybe we can uh, pray for a minute here and uh, ask the Lord to, to help us, guide us today. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us the, the things to say and to speak, Lord. And King David said, uh, set a watch by my mouth and keep the door of my lips. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that. And uh, if the uh, sweet psalmist of Israel and uh, the type of Christ and uh, this great man and this King David, Lord, uh, ha had to say that, uh, how much more uh, someone like me, Lord, and, and us who uh, don't have the, uh, the eloquence and the words and the wisdom and the things, Lord, that, that you've recorded as scripture. So please, Lord, uh, watch, watch over us. Uh, help us not to say things that are, that are wrong or that are incorrect. I pray that you would uh, just uh, let your word uh, strike uh, through our hearts and our conscience, Lord, the things that you would have us to learn and to know and uh, help us to grow as Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look at verse one, it says, now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, and then it goes down through there and it's recording towards the end of David's life, some of the things that he did, he said, some of his mighty men and their deeds. 
But one thing I just wanted to point out in verse one, it says, David, the son of Jesse said, the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of, of the God of Israel, the anointed, the word anointed is, or let me back up and I'll put this in reverse. The word Christ is the word, the anointed one. Christ means it's, it was the Greek word for the anointed one. So we have in the Bible, the word Jesus Christ means Jesus, the anointed. So David, he was the anointed of God and he is a type of Christ. Uh, very clearly, many, many times, uh, David was a type of Christ and what he did. You know, he uh, defeated, think about how he defeated the enemy of God's people after 40 days. This is just, just one. There's so many um, types of uh, typology in David's life and actions and things, deeds, words that are a type of Christ. But after 40 days, remember Goliath, It said for 40 days, he came out and defied Israel, 40 days. And when did David defeat him? At the end of the 40 days, he defeated the enemy of God's people. When did the Lord defeat the enemy of God's people, Satan, the end of 40 days of testing? That's that's just one. And there are so many. And and you you know that David is a type of Christ. But I want to point that out because even in this chapter, it says the anointed. So in verse eight, you have the mighty men of David, God's anointed. We can be and we ought to be the mighty men of God's anointed, Jesus Christ. We should be the Messiah's mighty. And we've talked about, so that's what I'm going to call this, uh, the Messiah's mighty. And in Sunday school, we sang a song. uh, I've got the mighty Messiah that manifests miracles down in the depths of my heart. The mighty Messiah. Well, the sermon, I'm going to call it the Messiah's mighty. Because yes, we have the the mighty Messiah in our heart that manifests miracles but we should also be mighty for the Messiah. And these men in verse eight, they were called mighty men for King David. And I, I want to focus on verse 10. It says, and he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. So Eleazar has this great victory. And look what it says in the middle of verse 10. And his hand clave unto the sword. How can a Christian, how can we be mighty for the Messiah, mighty for God? Here's three points, but the first thing it focuses on is that his hand cleaved to the sword. The first point is you have to have a sword. You can't be mighty for God. You can't be a mighty warrior. And yes, make no doubt of the have no doubt about it. We are to be warriors. It says in 2 Timothy, I, I actually shouldn't even phrase it that way. We are to be. We are warriors. And you're either on the front line as a Christian or you're not. Either you're doing your duty. Or you're AWOL, (laughs) you know, you're absent without leave. You're uh, in dereliction of your duty. You're not doing what you're supposed to be. But we are absolutely warriors and soldiers for Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Timothy 2 verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It says in Ephesians 6, uh, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, uh, principalities, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And it says, Take the whole armor of God. And, and many other times we can show where we are warriors. It's a spiritual battle. So how can you be a mighty warrior for the Messiah and be one of the Messiah's mighty? The first point, I'll just give you all three and then we'll take a look at them. The first one though is Eleazar here and verse eight, nine, and 10. Well, his name is given in verse nine. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite. Eleazar was mighty first because he had a sword. Second reason, he proved his sword. And a third, he used his sword. So let's look at the first one. He had a sword. A lot of Christians today don't even know whether they really have a sword. You know what the Bible says in uh, Ephesians 6, verse 17, uh, that chapter on the full armor, the whole armor of God, rather. It says, verse 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then uh, in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is called a sword. It says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing uh, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then in Revelation 1.16, when it's describing Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ to John, it says out of Jesus' mouth, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And remember, Jesus is the word. He's called the Word. In the beginning was the Word. 
and out of his mouth goes a sword. His sword is the word. He is the word. It's all one. Our weapon is the word of God that he gave us to live by. You know, we say as Baptists, it's our final authority as all matters in all matters of faith and practice. And it ought to be. This is our final authority. It doesn't matter if some man comes along and says, well, I'm going to start a uh, convention of Baptists and you have to believe that baptism gets you to heaven. Well, too bad. The Bible doesn't agree with that. If somebody comes along and says, uh, you have to uh, donate a certain amount of your money every year, tithe. If you don't give your tithe, well, you're not going to make it to heaven. Well, too bad. The Bible doesn't say that. Whatever men come up with, if it disagrees with the Bible, this is our final authority. This is the word of God. But what I wanted to say is he had a sword. And a lot of Christians today, you say, what is the sword? You ask any number of Christians, what is the sword of the spirit? Now say it's the word of God. And then you ask them, well, do you have the word of God? Oh, yes, I have the word of God. You know, and they're walking around with their new international version or their American standard version or their uh, new King James or whatever it is. And you say, do you have the word of God? Yes, I have the word of God. Can you rely on every single, and you ask them this question, can you rely on every single word in that to be infallible without error and without fail in the course of time and history? They won't say yes. And if they do, you know what, that, there's hope for that Christian because then you can say, hey, you know what, amen, thank the Lord you have that faith. Let me show you why uh, you can't rely on that one. And take them to Acts 8, 37, where 37 is taken out. Go to 1 John 5, 7, where the whole verse is taken out. Go to Luke 2, 22, where they uh, claim Jesus is a sinner and he had to be purified in the temple. Where in King James, it says uh, only Mary had to be purified according to the law. You know, have, it, it's good to have, you know, and you might say, uh, well, uh, you know, Brother John, I, Pastor, I haven't read all of the things. I haven't had the time to study this out the way you have. You don't have to know the whole, you know, is every warrior the general? Is every warrior the expert in every single piece of uh, weaponry? Does every warrior have full knowledge of the entire battlefield? No, we don't all. And I'm not saying that I do by any means, of course not, or, or that any one man does. But the Lord expects you to do what you can with what you have. Study the word of God. Know how to answer people. Have a verse. You know, look at if, if you happen to know some Christians or some brethren or some family that have uh, a particular preference of a lot of them like the NIV. That's a really big one nowadays. The New International Version is one of the biggest sellers in the United States and in other English speaking countries. Then if it's the NIV, then Acts 8.37 is a good one to go to or 1 John 5.7. And, there, and there's many others. But find one or two that you just know on the back of your, you know, you just got that on the back burner. And if you run into somebody and if they can sit there and say, look you in the eye and say, I believe this is the word of God, every single word, it's infallible without error, then they're really acknowledging that they believe God can and has preserved his words. And they think that that's it. That's good. Amen. Because that's the heart we ought to have. If you will, turn to uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12. So the first uh, reason that Eleazar, the first um, first point here is he could be mighty for the Lord, mighty for King David here, uh, because he had a sword. But in Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And verse 7, you know, it's, it's very clear what the Lord is preserving. What is he keeping? He's keeping verse six. The words of the Lord are pure words. They're purified. Thou shalt keep them. The Lord's going to keep his word. He said in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, three times the Lord has recorded, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The Lord's going to preserve his words. He said he would. It says, uh, let's go over to uh, Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, uh, we're going to do, uh, have your, uh, <laughs> your uh, book, your Bible, Mark, uh, ready if you're 
But uh, at any rate, be ready to turn. We're going to do quite a bit of turning here. Proverbs 22 and verse 17. It says, uh, verse 17 down to 21. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, they shall withal be fitted in thy lips that thy trust may be in the Lord. Verse 19, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. So historically, you know, King Solomon and there are some other writers of the Proverbs are writing Solomon specifically to his sons. You know, uh, he says, uh, my son, hear the words of my mouth, my son over and over. So historically, uh, the writing is, hey, I'm giving you wisdom from the Lord. I'm giving you something here. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom. But then practically, and then also for the Lord as a Christian reading this nowadays, well, Solomon isn't writing uh, specifically to you as a biological child, right? You know, it was 3,000 years ago. So this, just this morning, we were talking about the three applications. You have historical, doctrinal, and practical. So historically, you, know, have, you have the writer of the proverb, but then doctrinally and practically, the Lord is telling you, telling the Christian today, verse 20 and 21, Look at 19, that thy trust may be in the Lord. Verse 20, have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? We have the scripture written. Verse 20, uh, 21, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. When you ask people, what is the word of God? And they say, well, all the translations uh, are reliable and they, they all have the fundamentals of the faith. They'll say things like that, you know, which the truth is a lot of the doctrines are changed in these other, the, the fundamental doctrines, as they say. But it says, make thee know the certainty that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send thee. Well, if somebody sends to you and asks you, another Christian, an unsaved person, uh, hey, where's the word of God on earth? Do you have a sword? We have to have a sword to get into the battle. And Eleazar had a sword. The second point in verse 2, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Psalm 19, verse 7. Uh, the second point, Psalm 19, 7. Second point is he proved his sword. Have you proven the word of God in your own life? And have you proved your weapon? A, a warrior will train with the weapon. They won't, any uh, army or military worth its salt is not going to give their soldiers, their airmen, their sailors, they're not going to give them weapons that they haven't used or trained on. They don't know how to use it or at the very least, haven't uh, come to rely on it, then they're not going to be as effective as they could. And, and perhaps they'll just get themselves killed. So the second point, Eleazar back there, he had a sword. He proved his sword. The interesting thing, we're going to go to Psalm 19.7. But the interesting thing about a uh, double-edged sword is that it can be a danger to the one wielding it. And so there's, there's many other types of swords. And maybe you've seen those like uh, uh, Arabian scimitar, uh, scimitars and, you know, there's um, the uh, Japanese katana and, and all these different weapons out there around the world. And many of them just have a flat, dull uh, edge on the opposite side of the cutting edge. And, and that's, that is uh, sometimes intentionally. But at the very least, unintentionally, it's safer for the wielder. If they happen to be swinging that and say it grazes their own shoulder, say they're, they're making a move and it's coming along their thigh, that dull edge isn't going to hurt them as bad as a sharp edge. But the Bible, it says it's a two-edged sword. The word of God is quick and powerful. It says uh, sharper than any two-edged sword. Out of the Lord's mouth in Revelation goes a two-edged sword. So... The, in, in history, the, those training with a double-edged sword, like in England, they'd have the broad sword, a double-edged, and in, in, in other cultures, they would have them as well. But they had to be careful. They could cut themselves. They could hurt themselves. The Bible, it says in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The Bible cuts you. It cuts me as the wielder. You know, we're the ones here trying to wade our way through the world, the flesh and the devil, and these battles, spiritual battles the Lord has us in. And yet, 
it will also cut us when we need it. You need to be convicted by the word of God convicts you. You need to repent. The word of God opens up those wounds and those sores. And then also the interesting thing about a two-edged sword is that it can heal. One side of it can heal uh, like uh, through a cauterization. You heat, heat up a blade and you lay that on a wound and it'll cauterize it, put sudden heat on it and close that wound. So the other side can be for uh, wounding and cutting and this side you can have over here to heal and to bind up. And it says in Psalm 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. In verse 8, and we'll read down to 11. Verse 8, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. And we sing that song. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to sing that again tonight. Those five verses, 7 through 11. But see in verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord. In verse 8, the statutes of the Lord. In verse 8, the commandment. Also in verse 9, the judgments. Over and over, it's talking about the word of the Lord. All of these things are the Bible, the sword. And look what it does. Have you proven in verse seven that it converts the soul? Prove your sword. You don't, first, do you have a sword? Do you know you can rely on that weapon? This is the weapon the Lord has given me. But then have you proven it on yourself in your own life? Verse seven, converting the soul. It makes wise a simple. Verse eight, it rejoices the heart. Now, sometimes we... <laughs> We do get very discouraged and down and worn out. Go back to the resource, the weapon that the Lord has given you. When that warrior goes back to that sword and remembers the other victories and the other battles and sees the reliability of his living, that sword, it was the living, the lifeblood, everything to the warrior. Look at, think of Eleazar back there in 2 Samuel 23. It said his hand claved to the sword. That means he, he, he couldn't even, he had been in battle so long, he, he couldn't even pry his fingers open. It was just, his hand was gripping that sword so tight. The muscles had contracted and, you know, spasmed up there. His hand claved to the sword. We get discouraged and it says there in verse 8, rejoicing the heart. It says in the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It'll show you uh, what the right thing to do is. It'll sharpen your conscience. Sometimes we have, uh, many times we live life in a way where it deadens our conscience. We get saved and the Lord enlightens our eyes. And then sometimes after salvation, we live a certain way and we just don't follow the Lord the way we should. And the Lord will sharpen our conscience, enlighten your eyes. He'll show you what's pure, what's right. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So Eleazar proved his sword. You have to prove your sword. And a lot of times training is in solitude. Either, certainly in solitude from the battle. You don't train at the, on the front. <laughs> you know, when I said, you know, in uh, World War I, they didn't go out. They had the... Um, the uh, no man's land and the trenches dug across Europe and French, uh, France and Germany there. And they didn't go out there and set up a, a target range right in no man's land. Hey, uh, uh, Captain, we got to go train. Oh, yeah, sure. Send a uh, detail of men out there. They're going to, you know, work on their marksmanship. No, they would all be killed because they're in no man's land and the, the bullets are flying. The, the artillery's coming over. That's not the place to train. You prove your sword away from the front at home, in the solitude of your house, in your prayer closet. Some people actually have a closet that they go in and pray. That's good. Or somewhere that you can pray quietly and alone in silence. You know, don't, don't have your headphones in praying. <laughs> I don't know anybody that does that. Hopefully you don't. I mean, you can't, you know, we, we got to go before the Lord. But it just came to mind because everybody does everything now with their headphones, you know, like they, they work with their headphones. How are you really focusing on the job if you're listening to your music? I mean, come on, be single-minded. <laughs> the Lord tells us to, to be single-minded, not double-minded. 
but go to the Lord and prove the word of God, prove the, the efficacy or the effectiveness of the word of God in solitude, in training with the Lord, and then you'll be ready to use it. And if you go to uh, Jeremiah 48, and we're almost done, the third point was Eleazar used his sword. He used it. He didn't just have one. He didn't just prove it in training and kind of spar around and, you know, cross blades with his comrades in arms. And no, he, he used it in battle for the purpose that his weapon was given to him. The Lord gives you a sword of the spirit for a reason. Jeremiah 48. And it says in uh, Ephesians, remember, uh, 6 verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're in that spiritual battle. And it says in verse 17, after all of the other uh, weapons you take, it says, and some of them are defensive, some of them are offensive and both, but it says, take the sword of the spirit. It says, take the sword of the spirit. Not, well, if you want, you know, pick up your sword. If you feel like it, join the battle. No, it's a command. Take the sword of the spirit. Someday we're going to be with the Lord and he's going to want to get your report and you're going to stand before him and give him uh, the AA, <laughs> the AAR, right? The after action report. You're going to give the Lord an after action report and he's going to say, uh, tell me how you did in the battle. And he already knows, but we're going to give it to him. We're going to stand at the judgment seat. There's a judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. That's for you only. Judgment seat of Christ is not for unsaved people. Judgment seat of Christ, Paul said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord's going to say, what did you do with the weapon I gave you? Well, Lord, I wasn't sure that I really had one. You know, uh, I didn't know if we could rely on your word. Uh, the, my, Scott, my professors taught me in Bible school that it was uh, the originals, the Greek and Hebrew were perfect and they were inspired. And um, but that we don't have any Greek and Hebrew originals anywhere on this planet, as we don't. There aren't any. There isn't one original. There's copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And so if we don't have it, well, you know, Lord, I just wasn't sure. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I took uh, one of these uh, plastic daggers, you know, I, uh, and, and it, was, it was called the NIV. And I went to battle with that. And uh, every time I tried to use it, you know, the, the tip broke off and it looked like a spork. You know, it wasn't even a real sword. And yeah, that, I mean, that's what these guys are dealing with. You know, the, the word of God has power. Something that is not the word of God does not have the power of the word of God. I mean, it's that simple. You look through 300 years from 1600 to 1900 and the great revivals that went across Europe and America and then spread missionaries all over the world from this Bible only. And now where have those great revivals been? gone. Because in 1880 and 1901 and all these false Bibles that have been ushered in have polluted the word of God, polluted the words of the Lord. Christians don't even know which one is right. And the power of the Lord's word and the Lord's working is gone when they have those versions. So yeah, of course, our country, we're supposed to be the moral epitome in the world. And our country is leading the charge towards homosexuality and queer marriage and you know, you can be a girl, you can be a guy, and it's embarrassing. We should be ashamed as a country. We're, we're the ones who should be out there saying, get back to the Bible. And yet, why? Because we don't even have a Bible to get back to, as most we do. But <laughs> thank the Lord, we do. But most people aren't preaching it or teaching it. And the Christians, you know, are, if you have it, are, have you proven it? Prove the word of the Lord. Prove your sword. And so in Jeremiah 48, you, he used his sword, Eleazar. And it says in Jeremiah 48 in verse 10, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. It says in Romans 13, we have the, the, the well-known chapter about authorities. And we use this for policemen because it is policemen in, in the actual chapter. It's got soldiers and policemen in there, Romans 13. And it says, they don't bear the sword in vain. And it says we should have, uh, you know, give honor to whom honor is due. And uh, that's the uh, policeman's chapter, you know. And my brother's a policeman in Pittsburgh. He, uh, he's, on the, uh, he's a SWAT negotiator. And 
he's done every single type of training that <laughs> they have available. And uh, he's on his uh, 13th year, 14th. He started 2009. So he's got like uh, about 10 years till uh, some form of retirement he's looking to do. But Romans 13, it says they don't bear the sword in vain. The Lord also tells you as a Christian and a warrior, if you're going to be mighty for the Lord, don't bear the sword in vain. Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go to work or to the Christian uh, that doesn't believe the word of God and just lop their head off. <laughs> you're a heretic. You don't know anything about the Bible. No. You know, well, it said I had to draw blood, right? No. Give them something to think about. Hey, you know, the Lord said that uh, he would preserve his words and just prick their arm a little bit and let a little drop of blood come down. <laughs> is it, is it, does the Bible you have uh, preserved perfectly and infallible? You know, just uh, nick, nick, nick them on the cheek. Give them a little drop of blood there to think about. What? <laughs> no, but it says, Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. We are supposed to use it. We're in a spiritual battle. And then also keep in mind Ephesians 6. You know, it does say, keep, keep it back his sword from blood. And we're in a physical um, reality fighting a spiritual battle. So don't think, sit there and think that that Christian or that unsaved person you're witnessing to is in and of themselves the enemy because they aren't. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The devil, the world, and then our flesh, our own sin nature is fighting against the Lord, striving against the Lord's spirit. But remember, it says he used his sword in uh, 2 Samuel. So have a sword. Make sure it's settled in your mind. There is a perfect, preserved word of God on this planet. And then go prove it. Which one is that? Lord, uh, let me see it in my own life and the holiness and the uh, conviction and the enlightening uh, in Psalm 19, and the enlightening of the eyes, the purity, and the rejoicing, and all of these things, and daily living, and walking with you, and then you'll be ready to go out there and be an effective, mighty warrior for the Messiah. The Messiah is mighty. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee.